this one, sir. My name is Osama. We'll just be covering the content of uh, the acidic environment, section 4. That's a syllabus reference if you don't know that by heart already. Uh, okay, so let's start with the definition of acids. Uh, this is, uh, so acids have changed in definition over time. Starting with uh, Lavoisier, he said that acids are acidic because of the presence of oxygen. However, this theory could not explain why metallic oxides were not acidic. After that, Davy uh, evolved the definition of acid to the presence of hydrogen, which caused uh, acidity. However, this theory could not explain why many hydrogen compounds, such as methane and alkanes, uh, were not acidic, such as, as I said, methane, because they're not acidic hydrogens. Moving on to Arrhenius, he said that acidity was caused by dissociation into hydrogen ions in solution and uh, something was basic because of hydroxide ions and neutralization involved hydrogen and hydroxide forming water. But this theory, it, could, it was very close to reality but it could not account for uh, metallic oxides and carbonates and why they were basic and also it could not account for many salts and why they were acidic or basic. The current theory of acids uh, is the BL theory, and it defines acids as simply proton donors and bases as proton acceptors. And a conjugate base from this theory is simply an acid after donating, uh, after donating a proton, it becomes a conjugate base. And a conjugate acid is simply a base after accepting a proton. And neutralization is therefore it's just a transfer of protons from uh, the conjugate, from the acid to the base. And here's an example of uh, what I was saying. So HCl is a strong acid, and hence it's a proton donor. After donating the proton, the H goes, and it becomes a chloride ion. So therefore, for the acid hydrogen chloride, the chloride ion is a conjugate base. And the relationship between a salt and its conjugate is as follows. A strong acid will have a very weak base as its conjugate, and a very weak base will have a strong acid as its conjugate. And in, in between, it's just as you can see. Moving on. Okay, so, because uh, HCl is a strong acid, its, its conjugate is not just a very weak base because. Uh, as a strong acid such as HCl, it completely ionizes and dissociates into ions. And so uh, its conjugate chloride is not really a very weak base, but rather it's neutral because it has no capacity to accept uh, a proton. So just a correction there. And uh, we usually refer to uh, proton transfer reactions as neutralization to occur in solvents such as water, like uh, in aqueous solutions, but they can also occur yeah, as gases. In this reaction over here, hydrogen chloride gas with uh, with ammonia gas. So what happens is there's a transfer of protons from the ammonia gas to the hydrogen chloride, uh, which results in, or rather, sorry, the other way, a proton transfer, which result in which results in ammonium and chloride forming ammonium chloride salt. Next, uh, amphiprotic spe uh, species are species that can behave as proton donors and acceptors. And an example of such uh, species is the bicarbonate ion or hydrogen carbonate. So here you can see its reaction with an acid. It's actually acting as a proton acceptor here forming hydrogen carbonate. And over here it's reacting with a base to form, uh, to act as a proton donor to form carbonate ions. Similarly, uh, water itself is amphiprotic. It can act as a weak acid or a base. Over here you can see it acting as a weak acid, a proton donor, and here you can see it acting as a proton acceptor. So a proton is accepted by the water to form ammonia and uh, NH3 and uh, hydronium ions. So salts can be acidic, basic, or neutral, and we determine whether they are acidic or basic, or neutral with hydrolysis, basically the reaction of the salt with water. So a weak acid will react with a strong base, normally to form a basic salt, and a weak base will react with a strong acid to form an acidic salt. 
and acids and bases with of the same relative strength, such as strong acids and strong bases, they react to produce neutral salts. So an example of uh, basic salts are potassium fluoride and sodium acetate. And how we determine that they are basic salts is we hydrolyze the ion, the fluoride ion here. Once we hydrolyze this fluoride ions, uh, we can see that this will act as a proton acceptor and this will, the water will act as a proton donor, forming a weak fluoric acid and weak uh, hydrofluoric acid and it, will, and it will also form a strong base. So in this case, potassium is the spectator ion, so the base is potassium hydroxide. And if we look at the parent base, it's potassium hydroxide, which is a strong base, and parent acid is uh, hydrofluoric acid, which is a weak acid. So that means, because we've got a in the reverse reaction, we've got a strong base and a weak acid, uh, the salt produced must be a basic salt. And similarly, in the bottom reaction, we can see uh, that the acetate ion reacts with water to form acidic acid as a weak acid and a strong base, which means that the acetate ion is indeed a, uh, is a basic salt. Similarly, ammonium chloride and zinc sulfate are acidic salts. Again, with the hydrolysis, uh, we've got ammonium ion and water with the ammonium acting as a proton donor to form uh, NH3 and hydronium ions. So with the reverse reaction, this is a strong acid and a weak base, which results in a, an acidic salt being produced, which is ammonium chloride. And zinc sulfate, uh, with transition metals, you can also determine whether a salt is acidic or basic. That's because the hydrogen that is donated is because of the four surrounding uh, water molecules. So basically, with transition metals, it's something like this. You've got zinc, and then you've got a water molecule, a water molecule, a water molecule here. So the ion is actually Zn H2O, or two plus, and if we hydrolyze this with water, uh, this acts as a proton donor, and it results in Zn H two O H two O three OH plus plus H three O plus. So over here, you've got a strong acid and a weak base, which is this, which results in the acidic salt, which is the zinc ion. Uh, okay. Moving on to pH buffers uh, with an example in the human body. So buffers, if you didn't know this already, are, is a solution like an equilibrium that resists uh, changes in pH, counteracting, counteracting them through the Schottelio's principle. And buffer solutions, they usually contain a weak acid and its conjugate base, or a weak base and its conjugate acid. So here's an example. The carbonic acid hydrogen carbonate buffer, it's a buffer equilibrium, this one here, uh, that exists in the human body. And it's in blood, actually. And it's linked to the hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin equilibrium, which is this one. And it maintains blood pH. So how this works is as follows. Firstly, you should understand that this, the second one, although it looks very cryptic, it's just an equilibrium that is present in the blood. HB being a molecule which is irrelevant to the name at this point. And this is hemoglobin, and this is oxygen hemoglobin. And you can see that there's oxygen, water, and hydronia present in this equilibrium. So what happens is, during the inhalation, there is an increase in concentration of uh, oxygen that is dissolved. And that increase causes a shift to the left increasing hydronium concentration, therefore increasing blood acidity. However, this increase in acidity is counteracted by the buffer shifting to the left and restoring the initial pH. Next, uh, what happens is during cellular respiration, the oxygen gets taken into cells, reducing the concentration in this equilibrium, which shifts this equilibrium to the left. However, simultaneously, uh, the cells, they respire and respirate, rather, and they release carbon dioxide, increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide in the third equilibrium, and that increases carbon, carbonic acid concentration, which then shifts equilibrium number one to the right and increases blood acidity. So that increases blood acidity when the cells release carbon dioxide. However, when you exhale, respiration, 
causes an increase in acidity due to increased hydrogen concentration. Exhalation uh, causes a decrease in concentration of carbon dioxide gas, which decreases, uh, which shifts the equilibrium to the left and causes a decrease in carbonic acid concentration. And that causes equilibrium number one to shift to the left, decreasing acidity by decreasing hydrogen ion concentration. And that's how the buffer works. It maintains pH uh, during inhalation, cellular respiration, and exhalation. That's also why, uh, if, if I don't know, uh, if you've probably read this, if you hold in your breath and not exhale, that's bad for you because the carbonic acid is formed because of that carbon dioxide inside you. And as soon as you exhale, it decreases blood acidity by equilibrium number one shifting to the left. Next, volumetric analysis. So volumetric analysis, it requires the use of a standard solution with an accurately known concentration to determine the concentration of an unknown. Uh, and assuming your technique and equipment is accurate, the precision or accuracy of your final unknown concentration depends on how well you know the concentration of your standard. So the primary standard uh, we use must have the following properties. A high level of purity, an accurately known composition, it must be free of moisture, it must be stable, unaffected by air during weighing, soluble in water, and a high molar weight to reduce the percentage error. And unsuitable examples of primary standards are concentrated HCl because it fumes and loses gas as hydrogen chloride gas, concentrated sulfuric acid as it absorbs water from the atmosphere, Sodium hydroxide, it absorbs moisture from the air, and it also reacts with carbon dioxide in the air when being played. Hydrated sodium carbonate, effluoresces, it loses water when being weighed, and that's why anhydrous sodium carbonate is a suitable primary standard for volumetric analysis. Acid-based titration is, is one method of volumetric analysis that uses a neutralization reaction to determine the concentration of an unknown. So the endpoint, this, this technique uses, can use either an indicator or it can use electronic means such as a data logger and a pH probe. So if you use, a, if you use an indicator, the endpoint is the point in titration where the indicator just changes color. And the equivalence point is when the acid has, uh, like in terms of the mole ratio, it has completely reacted with the base. And a suitable indicator for titration is one whose endpoint closely matches the speed portion of uh, the titration graph, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, it must, the endpoint must be near to the equivalence point and also match uh, the speed portion, which I'll show you. So if we look at the titration of a strong acid and strong base, you can see there's an inflection point there, and that is the equivalence point where the sodium hydroxide and the hydrogen chloride, hydrochloric acid in this case, they have completely reacted with a one-to-one -one ratio, so there is no excess left. And the equivalence point is here, as I said, but if you want to determine a suitable indicator, it must be an indicator whose transition range is within this deep portion. Because if it is, for example, if the endpoint is here, when it should actually be here, the only difference uh, in volume is, the difference in volume is very minimal. So even if your endpoint is anywhere along that steep portion, it's sufficient for the titration. So in this case of the strong acid and strong base, the uh, endpoint can be anywhere between like 2 and 10. So you can use any of the three indicators from final blue, uh, phenolphthalein, or methyl orange. With a strong acid and a weak base, the equivalence point occurs uh, a bit earlier. The pH is a bit lower, so that limits your choice in indicator use. Uh, with weak acid and strong base, again, a bit higher pH at the equivalence point, so be wary of which indicator you have to use. However, with a weak acid and uh, weak base, the equivalence point does occur at pH 7. However, the steep portion is almost non-existent compared to the other uh, strong acid, strong base titration. So if you were to use an indicator which does not clearly indicate pH 7, uh, you might get, you might record it as something here which will actually be a much different volume to, actually it'll give you a volume that's much different to what it actually is. That's why uh, weak acid and weak base titrations are not recommended using indicators. 
Moving on, add two acid and base fills. So um, often in the industry and um, agriculture, and whatnot, you have strong acid and you know, strong uh, base spills. Um, this is a problem for the environment, of course. So to, in order to neutralize this, to make the pH neutral or as close to seven as possible, we use um, sodium hydrogen carbonate. And we use this because it, it is amphiprotic, which means that depending on the, um, oh, the context, it can be both an acid and a base. So it's a solid, so that's, that is also an advantage because it's easy to transport, it is high in density and whatnot. Um, it's also safe, and the and we, we can use this in excess because it's not harmful for the environment. At the end of the um, neutralization, it's indicated by the when the bubble formation stops, um, we know that it is safe to handle. Using a base, for uh, for example, to neutralize an acid spill is dangerous because if we use excess of base, it will cause an even worse situation compared to using um, just this amphiprotic. All right, um, HC 2015, question 24. Explain why the salt sodium acetate forms a basic solution when dissolved in water. Include an equation in your answer. Now, the equation is this. It's um, the basically the explanation as to why it uh, forms a basic solution is because the acetate ion does not have any excess hydrogen ions to donate. As a result, the only option for it is to um, to lose the one hydrogen on the end. Uh, to, sorry, to gain an, the hydrogen um, ion on the end, forming acetic acid. And in this case, the amphiprotic water molecule um, acts as the proton donor, which, according to the BL theory, is makes it an acid. Um, and so, due to the formation of the hydronium ions, um, it becomes a basic solution. Um, for part B, the solution is prepared by using equal volumes and concentrations of acetic acid and sodium acetate. Explain why the pH of the solution would be affected by the addition of a small amount of sodium hydroxide solution. Essentially, um, the answer to this question just uses the same equation as this. The marking guideline required this same equation. So um, by adding a sodium hydroxide solution, you increase the concentration of hydroxide ions. Due to LCP, this causes a shift in equilibrium towards the left. Um, increasing concentration of um, the water, water molecules, um, and so the pH is maintained uh, and does not does not get affected. Mm, the 2012 HSC question 30. A chemist analyzed aspirin tablets for quality control. The initial step of analysis was the standardization of an MNO solution. It's three 25 mil samples of uh, 0. 1034 mole for a solution of standardized HCl with titrated with the NaOH solution. The average volume required for neutralization was 25.75 mils. So, sorry? The answer to this, of course, will require an equation. Um, that's the equation. So, we'll, we use this um, to find the mole ratio between NaOH and HCl. Since we know the concentration of <clears throat> the concentration of the HCl, uh, we know that the mole ratio is 1 to 1. We use the concentration, which is 0.034 moles per liter, and we know the volumes of you know, both volumes. So we can calculate the um, number of moles of HCl, which will simply be the concentration multiplied by the volume, which gives us and since it's a one to one mole ratio, we know that that's the number of moles of um, OH, so the N, the number of moles of the um, hydroxide ions is the same. As a result, because we have the volume of um, NaOH, we can calculate the concentration. So, concentration ends up being this N and the other two. So, 2. Point. Number of moles.
Walls provided by volume, which was so that is the uh, solution uh, to plot A. Plot B asks us to calculate the average mass of um, aspirin per tablet. Since we know that it is uh, a one-to-one mole ratio between um, NaOH and the aspirin, we simply use the number of moles of hydrogen chloride from the, um, the previous question. We calculate that to be That's the number of moles of aspirin. So then we simply use the uh, molar mass of aspirin, which is 180.154, and the mass, we use the average mass given here, which is 16.55 milliliters. So that ends up being. And so the, the mass of, uh, the average mass of aspirin per tablet gives us that ends up being 200. 299.3 milligrams. If we multiply the two, um, the marking guidelines tell us that uh, in this question, if we had an error in part A to find the number of moles of hydrogen chloride, we will not be penalized if we carry on that mistake but have a correct precision. And for part part two, they ask why ethanol was used in the mixture of this, and this is because. Um, basically, as we all know, ethanol is a universal solvent. It sol uh, can dissolve both polar and non-polar substances. Um, this is the aspirin molecule, and as you can see, we have the polar end of OH. That will easily dissolve in the water, but we also have, very clearly, the benzene, um, which is non-polar. So the ethanol is used to drastically improve the solubility of ethanol, uh, 